If you know your oats and want to feel your oats and taste how good an oat cereal can be, well, you go for Cheerios. Great way to start the day with really great eating. That's Cheerios, one of the few foods made from oats. The tasty cereal grain everyone should have at breakfast. Crisp and golden, as only a toasted oat cereal can be. And nourishing? Why, a Cheerios breakfast gives you the power protein that grown-ups need to help stay in trim and youngsters need to grow on. Toasted oat goodness, toasted oat flavor, a delicious power breakfast. That's Cheerios. If you know your oats, and want to feel your oats, and want to taste how good an oat cereal can be, you go for Cheerios. feel um, uncomfortable like in Australia I get too far from the coast I get really uncomfortable I like I like the water um, um, I grew up um, doing a lot of fishing and um, and uh, just hanging out at the beach and um, I particularly like west coast beaches um, uh, and I think that because um, they're quite wild you know and um, going for a swim is not going for a swim it's like um, there's almost a survival thing happening and you know the rougher the better you know like west coast beaches and I like motorcycles and um, um, it's always been a passion and, and, and cars and, and I like reading um, <clears throat> and these are all things I've had to remember that I like doing you know I didn't read for, for a book for um, 15 years I didn't read a book and, and uh, now I passionately read every day I love reading family friends like a simple life today uh, my grandparents had a lot to do with raising me both sets of grandparents and um, uh, my mother's parents there was no alcohol allowed on the property um, they were teetotalers I knew that word and, uh, and I knew why, that it had done a lot of damage in, in, in the family and um, uh, I was quite um, a willful little boy and um, I wanted, so I, I distinctly remember the first time I tried spirits and being sort of obsessed with it from there on in, just obsessed with, the, with, the, with um, what I know now is the, the absence of anxiety, you know, and growing up being, in, being anxious and not knowing that I carried anxiety and being obsessed with alcohol. I remember being about 18 and not being able to to go to work without without um, uh, without smoking a joint, you know, and then every smoker break, just and thinking this is not normal. And then through my life, uh, there are a lot of indicators that that my my, my, my drug and alcohol use wasn't normal. Um, if there's such a thing as normal, I remember um, after losing everything and still being in a lot of denial. My auntie saying, you know, uh, why don't you go to the Salvation Army? They help people like you. And I was like, what do you mean people like me? And I don't think I really accepted that I had a problem um, until I read a probation report <coughs> written by a really nice guy. I was really lucky to get a nice probation worker and he, and he wrote a, a pre-sentence report and it just said, you know, Lance um, has never been, 24 years of poly substance abuse has never been on this earth as a clean or clear-minded adult. And, um, and I thought, wow, that's me he's talking about. I've actually never walked this earth uh, not intoxicated as an adult, you know. And, um, yeah, and that's where the, where the journey started, I suppose. Mm. My faith journey is, is, is a story in itself. Um, um, I was raised in a home where um, there was no, no church, no religion, no, no faith. Um, I remember being about four or five years old and my, my auntie, who was very um, religious, uh, gave me a children's Bible and I remember quite liking it. Um, but yeah, it was sort of frowned upon, I guess, in, in, in my house. And, um, my grandmother had a, in, in a china cabinet, she used to collect a lot of trinkets and there was a, a little card, um, one of the trin trinkets that said, uh, sitting in a, in a church no more makes you a Christian than sitting in a hen house makes you a hen, you know, and um, I think that always sort of stuck with me and um, through my life I, um, <clears throat> I never really liked religion, um, still, still don't to be honest, um, but um, I've always believed in, 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 in a higher power of God, you know, a divine knowing spirit of the universe. and. Um, and so, yeah, coming to um, to become a follower of Jesus has been a, has been a process, you know. And um, prayer was something I never did. Um, I, I used to say what I referred to as the Baal prayer, you know. Um, you know, God, 
get me bail on Monday and I'll do things differently and, um, and then offer not living up to that. Um, two times I've really prayed hard um, when, I, when I've been in addiction was uh, both times, um, sorry the first time was in prison and, um, and just praying you know God uh, um, get me out of here you know the bail prayer get me, get me into, um, into treatment and, um, and I'll give it my best shot I think it was, was, was the deal you know to make deals and yeah, I got I got I uh, got bail, and I went to Federal Street, and then the Salvation Army Bridge, and and I think I got to see um, Christianity in actions there. You know, um, I was like still had really really antisocial behaviours. You know, and um, uh, was there trying to just tick boxes to to get out of the system, and um, and they just kept saying, well look. Uh, you know, I was playing up like a second-hand lawnmower, and they were just saying, "Look, you know, we love you. Jesus loves you. It's all right." And I thought that was pretty cool. Um, the second time, I, 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 I prayed. I, I'd, I'd been relapsing for a year and a half, and I was um, in a house on the North Shore, living with a whole lot of people on the methadone program, and it was it was really a horrible place. And um, I didn't know how to stop using, how to get back to recovery. Um, and um, and I said. Uh, you know, God show me the way back to recovery and, and this time I'll do what I'm told, I'll do whatever I'm told and um, yeah, and a week later I was back in the justice system and um, yeah, um, with a bit of extra motivation able to um, reach out and get clean and, um, and I've tried to do that through, through my recovery. Um, <clears throat> I value growth because um, I, didn't, I didn't use drugs and alcohol because I had a bad day um, and uh, I didn't end up where I was because I'd had a, a bad week, you know. Like I, I remember um, being um, in my mid thirties and just looking back and, and just knowing that I'd had bad decades, you know. Um, and uh, you know, obviously, uh, in the later part of that, self-medicating hadn't helped. As a, as a child, I always felt different. I felt separate and I felt alone, and uh, just didn't really know how to do do life. Um, growth was about um, being able to confront all the, the maladaptive ways that I, I had formed of, of coping with life and um, yeah it was hard but it was good. <clears throat> I think that a lot of the problems that we have uh, in New Zealand and, 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 um, and, and even globally um, through some of the countries that our culture has followed um, uh, in past decades uh, we celebrate financial growth you know we don't value who a person is we, we you know have you got what, what do you do for a job you know do you own a house and, and, and that sort of growth has led to a lot of problems um, I guess I guess I've always one of my one of my key values is um is kindness and um, and uh, I was reminded watching a movie recently of one of, of one of my favourite sayings you know if you if there's ever a choice between being right or being kind choose to be kind and um, and uh, and feel how it is to grow as a as a human being you know um, rather than um, you know growing the bank account for example and, and get to experience stuff in a different way. God's done for me what I couldn't do for myself, you know, and just just um, really believing in my heart that there is um, that you know uh, God can move mountains, but I better bring the shovel. Just 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 having that faith, that belief, um, has given me the uh, the courage to take steps uh, in my life that have given me growth. You know, without Him, I lack the courage. You know, growth requires change, and change is uncomfortable. You know, as humans, we look for certainty and. Um, you know, only when the, when the pain of staying the same outweighs the fear of change do we do something different and for me personally I've had to that's where my faith has come in has given me the courage to, to take those steps towards change don't spend too much time trying to work it all out because greater minds than mine and yours have tried to work this out for centuries um, that faith is a choice you know uh, it's a choice and yeah make that choice and, and, and see how it goes you know uh, take the actions you know pray even if you don't know who's listening what's listening um, try it you know take the actions make a choice take the actions and um, you know, what is it faith is um, a belief in things unseen, unseen with evidence yet to come so you know take the action and see what comes yeah, I don't think I'd be the person I am today if I hadn't experienced the things that I've experienced. And um, what I've what I realised that God was always there, um, just waiting for me to reach out. And um, yeah. Is Lawrence here? Oh, he is right here. Thanks so much, Lawrence, for sharing your story. Um, for those of you who may not know Lance, um, he's on Team Year, and honestly, such an asset to our community, such an um, asset of someone who's just willing 
um, to actually make a difference in people's lives. And we so appreciate you, Lance. Um, yeah, you've made us better. Um, you make so many people stronger. And just allowing God to use you. Um, yeah, and today, thanks for sharing your story. Thanks so much. <laughs> appreciate you. Um, if this is your first time at Grace Gate today, um, we just want you to know that, yeah, we're a church where no perfect people are allowed. And, and this is the reason why, because we want people to, to come here feeling that they can be welcomed, that this isn't a religious organization, but this is a life-giving organization where people are living and breathing and going through um, difficult struggles in life and actually finding hope um, and community and faith in God who is isn't about religion, but he's so about relationship. So um, we just, yeah, welcome you today if it's your first time. If you're back again, welcome back on the long weekend. Um, there's no better place to be at Gracegate on a Saturday morning. So yeah, it's good to have everyone here. And we've been um, unpacking. We started last week with a brand new series called um, A Valuable Life. And we're trying to look at some values that honestly we believe if we live by them, that will bring so much meaning and so much value into our lives. And so last week, we unpacked what value? Who can remember? Fun, right? The value of fun. And um, it challenged me because I was like, man, yes, Wesley, you, you take yourself too seriously. Um, there's so many opportunities where you need to capitalize on fun and um, joy and laughter, but you're so serious all the time. And so I challenged myself, and I hope you guys did as well. Zolia gave us a challenge to actually write down um, how you're going to have fun this week and how you're actually also going to share fun with others. So did you guys do it? Yes. yes? Awesome. All right. I, it came to Sunday, and on Sunday, um, man, it, you know, we have the saying that Sunday is fun day. Um, but Sunday was glum day for us. All right. It was no fun. Everything that we wanted to do. Um, wasn't working out, and it actually led me to just being frustrated all the time. Have you had days like that? And um, I'm just trying, in the back of my head, I'm thinking the whole time, have fun. How can we have fun? How can we institute fun? Um, didn't really work out, but it, um, Zalia shared about being intentional. And um, this week, yeah, we were intentional. Um, we had some fun. We, we had fun with others as well. And so I hope you are still implementing that value in your life, all right? If you didn't do it this week, try um, this week coming, try this weekend um, to see how can we actually make life more fun. So today, I want us to unpack, um, as Lance has introduced it and shared a bit about it, is this value of growth. And um, I actually, it, it's interesting because when I was thinking about this, this is pretty much what I share about every single um, Saturday if I'm up here. I'm speaking about the value of growth. And if you here yeah, this morning... Um, this is probably something that you value, even though you may have not defined it, even though you may have not written it down, um, you probably value growth. And the reason you yeah, if you haven't just been dragged yeah, is because you actually want to grow in life. You want to grow in, in your journey. Um, you want to grow in um, whatever area it is in your life. Um, but ex specifically, yeah, at Gracegate, as we speak, we want to grow in our faith journey um, because we believe that sort of everything flows from that. Um, as we grow in our relationship with God, um, our relationships with others grow. If we grow in our relationship with God, um, our work environment gets better. There's something that shifts and changes in our hearts um, when we grow. So this is something that I value. Um, I think, you know, it's an essential value to have in life um, because we can always improve. We, we never arrive there. We never arrive at a point in our life where we say, hey, okay, I figured it all out. And that's the exact same with our faith journey. Yeah, Gracegate, we always speak about we, um, one of our values, which is discovering, which means that we don't know everything about God, that we don't know everything about life, but we're still on a journey trying to learn and discover and get better. So today I thought I want to share a story with you, one of my favorite stories um, from, the, from a book in the Bible. And um, this story pretty much unpacks a bit about growth, but more it, it's going to unpack the things that hinder growth. Why don't, if, if, value, if growth is such a key value in our life, it, it is, if it is something that is so valuable for our lives, 
then, then um, why don't we grow all the time? Why aren't we moving forward all the time? Um, what are the things that are obstructing us from actually growing? And so what I want to do today is I'm just going to unpack this story. I'm going to share it with you, and I hope that you can place yourself in the character's shoes and see, hey, where in my life do I resonate with some of the themes that we're going to come across today? Is that good? We're all good with that. All right. So the story is found in the book of 2 Kings, and um, I'm going to kick it off straight away. Key characters, Naaman. All right. Now, Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded. So our key character that we're going to speak about today is Naaman. He's um, a commander. He's pretty much second in charge. He's the guy who's going into battle um, leading all the troops and getting all the victories. Um, and he's a great man, and especially in the sight of his master, in the sight of the king. And the reason is highly regarded is because he's bringing back all the wealth, right? He's going into different nations. They're conquering the nations. They're coming back with all the wealth. They're coming back with all the treasures. They're coming back with slaves. And for this reason, he is um, yeah, highly regarded. It goes on. And it says, because through him, the Lord had given victory to Aram, to Aram, he was a valiant soldier. What's interesting is Nahum wasn't actually um, a guy who actually believed in the God of Israel. Um, he was actually a pagan and believed in all the pagan gods um, from an area which nowadays is called Syria. And this is the story of this valiant soldier. He was honestly a, a great warrior. And if we have to think of a valuable life as the world would define it, we would see this guy. Um, he's got position. He's got prestige. He's got possessions. And I mean, he is, yeah, he, he's just, you know, he's living a valuable life. He's got everything that some of us would define as success. But then it says, but he had leprosy. Now, in this day and time, if, if you don't know what leprosy is, um, it was a sickness and it was a terminal illness, all right? This was something that um, would not be cured. There, there weren't any, any people who understood how to um, actually conquer and cure leprosy. And so when you um, got leprosy, this would, this would be a sign, sort of people would see it on your skin. Um, it would be pretty visible. And for a man of, who, of such high regard, um, you can imagine how Naaman would have been feeling. When I think about this, I think, man, he's got everything going for him, but it's as if he's got this, this little um, thing in his eye. Have you ever had something in your eye and it's just so frustrating and irritating, all right, all the time, just bothering you, or you've got something in your shoe and, you know, whenever you walk, you can just feel that, that niggling feeling? Yeah, we see that Naaman has leprosy. He, he has everything going for him, and in this context, Leprosy um, was actually, you know, people didn't want to be around people who had leprosy, all right? Um, so you can imagine the shame and, and I guess the joy that would have been stolen from Nahum's life, some of the peace that would have been stolen from his life. And today as we sit here, um, I want you to think of, of, of what is the thing, what's, what's the stone in your shoe? What's the niggle in your eye? What is that thing that, that is stealing your joy what is that thing that is actually stealing um, from a valuable life, from actually growing? Um, maybe it's the things that we don't want to address. Maybe it's the things that, that are deep within our heart. And we know if we could just, you know, get this sorted out, this, this would make our life so much easier. Maybe it's the frustrations of, of some relationships that we're in. Maybe it's the, the stress of work. Whatever it is, I want you to, to relate with that in the story about Naaman. And then it goes on and it says, Now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and had taken captive of a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. So here we have them go out into Israel. Um, they conquer it and they bring back slaves and they bring back this young um, girl. And scholars would say she'd probably only be about 10 to 13 years old. And she becomes Naaman's servant, all right? Um, or Naaman's wife's servant, okay? So she serves in the house, probably would always see Naaman around. 
Um, and this is um, significant about what she does. Look what she does. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who is in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. I mean, imagine you were caught as a slave, all right? You were a captive in a house, and then um, the master, all right, has leprosy. I mean, if, if it was me, I would be thinking in myself, I'd be thinking, man, I hope he dies, right? I hope he doesn't get better, and I hope he actually pegs. That's what I'd be thinking. Here, yeah, this girl, between 10 and 13 years old, she decides that, hey, she goes to the mistress and she says, hey, I know someone who can actually help and actually cure um, the leprosy that Naaman's um, busy struggling with. Imagine that. This, this young girl is actually saying, hey, I'm a captive, I'm a slave here, but what I know is that there's actually someone, there's a prophet in my hometown who can actually cure you. And obviously, um, Naaman has probably struggled and, and tried to figure out what could cure his leprosy all the time. And so straight away, as, as he discovers this, his wife obviously shares this with him. He goes, and this is what happens. Naaman went to his master, and he told him what the girl from Israel had said. And the, the king then says, by all means go. The king of Aram replied, I will send the letter of the king of Israel. So yeah, he goes, Naaman approaches the king and he says, hey, I, I want to go. I've heard about this prophet in Israel. I know it's the place we conquered and I know there's not much left there, but there's, apparently there's this prophet there. And I mean, if he could heal me of leprosy, if he could just take away something that I've been trying um, to take away by myself and there's nothing there, then shouldn't I give it a shot? And the king would say, hey, by all means. And obviously the king would say this because, I mean, this is his top guy. This is the guy who's bringing in all the goods for him. So the king says, hey, not only go, but I'll even write you a letter. I'll give you my backing. And then so Nahum left, taking with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 sets of clothing. I was puzzled when I read this because why 10 sets of clothing, right? But obviously, yeah, Naaman goes, he's a rich guy, he's wealthy, he's, um, you know, he's got success, and so he, he decides, hey, I'm going to take all this wealth, and, and if you understand how much this is worth, this is probably more than Israel even had at that time, all right? So he's bringing a huge amount of wealth with him, and so that he can approach the king, so that he can approach the prophet and say, hey, he has everything I've got. He has even 10 sets of clothing, all right, that I want to give you. Now heal me, like cure me of my leprosy. He says, the letter that he took to the king of Israel read, with this letter, I am sending my servant Naaman to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. So the king of Israel receives this and as soon as, sorry, we can go to the next one. And as soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Yeah, the king of Israel, pretty much like this tearing of robes was like chucking your phone across the room, all right? Frustrated, angry. Um, and he's like, who do you think I am? Do you think I'm God that I could cure this guy of his sickness? And then, it goes on and he says, why does this fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he is trying to pick a quarrel with me. In other words, the king of Israel at this time, when he receives this letter, he's thinking to himself, hey, <laughs> these guys are just, they actually trying to have a setup here. They're trying to actually disguise this as actually a plan to actually come and conquer and raid us once again. He's thinking that, hey, because he, he hasn't the, the tools or he doesn't have the skills to actually heal this person, that what he'll do is he'll go back to his, his, his hometown. He'll say, he couldn't heal me, and then they'll all come and actually destroy them again. So the king is angry. He's enraged here. But then there's this guy called Elisha, the prophet, right? And when Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes he sent him this message. He says, why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me and he will know 
that there is a prophet in Israel. Now, what's interesting about Naaman here is that what he does is what most of us would do. Like, I mean, if we are sick or if there's something that we're struggling with and we know if we could cure it and get better, um, we want to go to the top guy, right? We'll get all our wealth. We'll, we'll do whatever we can. We'll go to the top surgeon. We'll go to the top doctor and, and we'll pay for it. And that's exactly what, what um, Naaman did. He went to the king of Israel thinking that the king would actually help him. But interesting, the servant girl, the young girl, what did she say in the beginning of the story? She said, there's a prophet, right? There's a prophet. There's a, there's a man of God who I know can bring you this cure. So now Naaman, um, you know, Elisha hears about this. And so obviously the king of Israel um, tells Naaman this. And so yeah, Naaman is off his, and on his way again. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and he stopped at the door of Elisha's house. I want you to picture this. I want you to understand what, what Naaman is doing here. This is a guy of power. This is a guy who has, the only time he's been to Israel is when they raided it. The only time he's been there is when they actually conquered it and they stole from this place. And now he has to go back to that same place. And now he's actually trying to look for a cure. He's actually going to this place, trying to ask for help. I can imagine him just driving through um, on his way to Elisha's house. I mean, if people saw him on chariots, um, guess what they would do? They would flee, right? Because they would be fearful. They, they would know, hey, what happened before? And he arrives at Elisha's house, and, and I can just imagine already the tension, the frustration, the, the sort of awkwardness of the, what is happening here. Um, and this is what happens. Crazy. Elisha then sent a messenger to say to him, Go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored, and you will be cleansed. Very interesting. Naaman approaches Elisha's house, gets to his house, and the prophet, Elisha, doesn't even come to answer the door. All right? He says, like, your success, your fame, your wealth, everything that you bring and you park outside my house doesn't change a thing. Like, that's not going to, like, you know, transform the way I think about you. And what he does is he, is he actually just sends a messenger to him and he says, hey, what I want you to do is I want you to go and wash seven times, dip yourself seven times in this river called the Jordan, all right? And when you do this, you're going to find that your flesh is going to be restored and you're going to find healing. Now, if I heard this, what would I do? I mean, if I've had that thing in my eye all my life, if I'm struggling with this, I would probably like, oh, yeah, okay, if this is the solution, all I have to do is go and dip in the, in the Jordan River seven times. Hey, okay, let's go and do it. But imagine the emotions that he's feeling. Imagine the awkwardness and, and now being challenged to, to go and do something so silly like going to a river and just dipping in this river. So it goes on and... Naaman went away angry, all right? He's furious that Elisha doesn't even come and meet him at the door. And he said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord as God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. And I highlighted, I thought, because I think in the context of growing and growth, we always think a lot of things, right? We always think, well, uh, I'm sure if I do things like this, then God will, will do this. And I love how, how, how he says, you know, he, he's, he's angry, he's furious because he's like, you know, the, the prophet should have come over and he should have just waved his hand over my leprosy and he would have cured it. But I think this is sometimes what we struggle with in in life is, is where we have these expectations for God to do the things the way we want him to do it. But his thoughts are, are not our thoughts. The way God operates and, and the way we see growth is completely different. And over here, um, yeah, Nahum's angry. It goes on then. 
And he says, Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? It's like, hey, we've got rivers out in our hometown. I could just go back there and wash. I don't want to go to this filthy, dirty Jordan River and wash there. Like, why do I have to go there? That's stupid. That's dumb. And so what happens is he turns and he went off in rage. Think about this. He, he had this opportunity that, to, to be healed. This thing that's bothering him all his life. He, he had this opportunity to grow. And because of this simple task to go into this dirty river and go and get washed there, he decides, hey, I'm, I'm not going to be able to do this because of my pride. I mean, I'm second in charge in, in my hometown. I can't do this. This is humiliating. And because of, of his pride, and because he, he can't humble himself, he misses out on his healing. I wonder how many of us, in our season of faith, or that thing that we struggle with because of our pride, and because of the, just, you know, the things that we have in control, we miss out on what God wants to actually do in our lives, the way he wants to bring healing and growth. The awesome thing about this story is it doesn't end there. And even though he throws his dummy out and he's, he's upset and he's angry, he turns around and he's on his way back home, this is the awesome part of the story. It says, Naaman's servants went to him and said, yeah, he has this community, his servants, his guys, his homies, all right? Not really his homies. They just have to do everything that he says or else they'll kill him. Um, or he'll kill them, sorry. But he, they approach him and, and this is what they say. They say, my father. And I, and I love how they word this because obviously they, they're showing that there's a relationship there. They're showing that there's a concern there. They're showing that there's actually a love there. And they say, hey, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? Like, I mean, if the prophet said, hey, if you just went to the Jordan and you swam seven laps, would you not have done it? And probably he would respond and say, yeah, I'd do that. I'd, I'd show them I can swim seven laps. Or, if, or if, they, if the prophet said to him, hey, you need to go and climb up this, this huge mountain and get to the top. Would you go and do that? And, and, and he probably would say, yes, I would go and do that because I can do that. That is, that is up to me. That is all my strength. I, I can do that. But then he shares and he says, hey, how much more then when he tells you wash and be cleansed? In other words, why wouldn't you do such a simple thing, such a thing that doesn't even require any of your strength? I know this, this is, you know, it... It will humble you, but, but I mean, it doesn't require any great effort. And I love these guys because what they do is they speak into Naaman's life and they tell him things that he really needs to hear, not the things that he wants to hear. You know, if we want to grow in life, we need a community and we need people in our life who will actually tell us the truth, who will have our best interest at hand who will tell us what really needs to happen so that we can actually take a step forward and make growth in our life. And yeah, these servants do this. The servants, they, they have no status. They, they are, you know, they, they have no pretty much, you know, I don't know about their education, but they actually could actually even be killed for approaching um, Naaman and actually suggesting this. But they do it because they care about him. And so then the story goes that, that um, Naaman actually goes down to the Jordan. So he went. And what he does is he says, okay, yes. Yes. If this is what I'm going to have to do. Yes, I'll do it. And he goes down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God had told him. And his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. I love this story. Picture yourself going down to this Jordan. Like th this is, you know, your pride is just out the window. You, you're heading back to, to, to this place that you actually conquered. There could be people staring and seeing you. You're stepping into 
to, to this, um, this river, taking all your armor off, getting in. And, and can you imagine Nahum the first time he dipped in and got out, looked at his skin and saw like, hey, nothing's changed. Nothing's changed. I mean, I can imagine, and this is probably what some of us do, is that on the first go, when we see that nothing's changed, we give up. We throw in the towel and we say, hey, this isn't for us. This faith thing isn't for us. Maybe on the second time he did it, on the third time, maybe on the fourth time he comes up and he still sees that there's nothing that has shifted in his life. Nothing has changed. But Wes, I've been in church for, for a number of years now, and honestly, I'm still, I'm still doesn't feel like I'm growing. I'm in this community group, and honestly, I, I don't know. Like, I don't see any difference in me. I mean, it's so easy to give up. Nah- Nahum could have given up straight away, but he continues the fifth time, the sixth time, and after only the seventh time, When he comes up, he sees a difference. He sees that he's been healed. And probably for the first time, he realizes that, hey, it had nothing to do with the water. It had nothing to do with the water. He realizes that 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 was happening the whole time with him, yeah, was actually just his faith and his trust in God. It's this tension that we all wrestle with every single day of our lives when we know what we need to do because, you know, God speaks to us and and we know what is the wise thing to do, but sometimes we decide, no, we're not going to do it. It's too difficult. It's too hard. It's the tension we have to navigate each and every day of our lives. And as we speak about the value of growth, as we grow is when we decide, yes, I'm going to allow God to do what God does best. Today, I want to ask this question, and I want to see what is obstructing your growth? What is obstructing? What is is hindering your growth? What what are you dealing with in life that, you know, is it it your pride? Is it your pride that, that, you know, you you think, man, I know too much. Like, this stuff just sounds so... Wishy-washy, like, I mean, Naaman over here in this story, I mean, he wasn't even a Jesus follower. He didn't even know God, all right? He believed in all different gods and pagan gods. Is it your pride that is maybe actually, hey, obstructing your growth? Is it your thoughts and your opinions, your own thoughts and opinions? Remember, Naam said when he said, hey, I thought... I thought God was going to do something completely different. I thought he would wave his hand over that spot. But what God was actually doing is he was trying to wave his hand over another spot. And that was the spot of faith and trust that you will just see who I am. Maybe it's a lack of follow through. Maybe the reason you're not growing is because, you know, you've given up on the second round. You've given up on the third time. Maybe you, you say, man, I don't know, I've, I've, I've done the work, I've done the steps in the program, and hey, you know what? I just can't anymore. It's not working for me. These meetings aren't working for me. Maybe it's failing to trust the process. When you're dipping down, time three, four, five, six, just like, man, I don't know. Is this how God works? I, I want Him to work in my way. Like, I've got stuff I can just give Him. I've got all the wealth. I'm really successful. If you just take this, I'll pay you and you just honor me back. That's not the way God operates. Or maybe it's your environment of people that's hindering you from growth. Maybe the people you surrounding you that are surrounding you aren't the people like the servants in the story who aren't speaking into your life the truth and love. Stuff that will really help you to actually move forward and actually grow. If we go on in the story, we see what happens next is that then Nahum and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and he said, so he goes back to Elisha after he's been healed. 
And this is what he says. Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Yeah, remember, this is the place he conquered. He comes back to the prophet and he says, man, I have seen, I have tasted and I've experienced that there is no other God like the God of Israel. You know, I've tried to kill my leprosy through so many other ways, but today I see that there is a God who does it for me. There is no other God. Today, whatever that stone is, whatever that thing is in your eye, there is a God who can actually bring healing, who can actually cure that. And so what he does then is, um, if we go one back, sorry. He says, now I know there is no God in all the world except in Israel. And he says, so please accept a gift from your servant. He says, hey, I've, I've got all this wealth that I brought with me. And now please accept it. Yeah, Elisha, I want you to take it. And he says, the prophet answered, as surely as the Lord lives, whom I serve, I will not accept a thing. And even though Naaman urged him, he refused. Naaman trying to give him and, and sort of pay him and just, you know, give him this gift. And he says, hey, it, it, it wasn't me. It's just I'm serving God and I'm refusing your gift. The story goes on and I don't have it up, but go home and read. It's an interesting thing that happens next. Um, with his with his messenger, but when I think of this whole this whole story, and I think of growth, you know, there's so many things I could tell you about the value of growth and the way we should grow. But I thought, man, we actually need to conquer the things that are hindering us from growing. And I think one of the biggest is pride. And I think the easiest way to actually conquer that is just to say yes. When people speak into our life, like the servants, just to say yes. When we know that God is speaking to us and saying, hey, Wesley, you need to go and say sorry and say, you know, get, give forgiveness or ask for forgiveness, then we just say, yes, I'm going to do that. You see, as we do this, as we partner with God working in us, that's how we grow. I brought um, my yes button today. I don't know if you've heard these yeses, but this is how our yeses should sound. You know, when God speaks to us and He says, hey, you need to do this, even though it, it sounds totally against the way we think God should work, we should just respond and say, yes. isn't that good? Imagine if we did that. Or if, if He says to us, hey, I want you to go and reach out to that person and go and help that person, serve that person, and we just go, yes. Imagine if this was our response, just a whole bunch of yeses the whole time. Just the whole time. But the problem is our pride gets in the way. We try and figure it out by ourselves the whole time. The cool thing about this is the way we grow in our faith journey is one yes at a time. One yes at a time when God's speaking, we're just responding. And the more we respond, the more we grow. There's a couple of themes that are echoed, oh, if we go to the next, the next one, a couple of themes that are echoed throughout um, his story, and, and the one is humility. I mean, humility just needs to be there in our lives. If we could just surrender, if we could just give in, if we could just say, hey, God, I'm going to trust you. I've tried to do everything by myself. Um, this could strengthen and this could help us to grow. The other thing in his story is repetition continuously just doing yes 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 i'll do this going down once twice three times don't give up don't give up because growth will happen growth will come and then the last thing in his story is results because you see that there was a progression that there was growth he wasn't the same that he was when he went to israel and if we keep saying yes and responding to god there's going to be growth growth is going to happen it just happens automatically. God, today, as we speak about the value of growth and we speak about the story, um, we can relate in so many different ways. And today, you know um, what yes we're not saying yes to, um, what question you're actually posing to us, what challenge you're actually speaking into our life, what stone we've got in our shoe, what thing we've got in our eye, what thing is actually separating um, us from you, God. And today we just want to say, hey, we want to give in. We want to surrender. We want to say, hey, we, we want to try it your way, God. 
um, we know growth happens there. And so today, God, we pray that um, we can respond with a yes. Whatever our, our challenge is, whatever our need is, thank you that you're not a God who expects payment, who expects performance, who expects us to um, do things so that you can actually respond. No, you just want our trust. You want our faith. Um, it had nothing to do with the water. And so today, God, um, we just want to surrender and say, hey, we're trusting in you. Come into our lives. Help us to say one yes at a time and show us how we grow in our faith journey. In Jesus' name, amen.